Welcome to the Inside Silverstone podcast, a business-focused podcast covering all things tech, engineering and innovation. Hosted by me, Chris Broom, a huge tech, motorsport and gaming fan and also the owner of Longhurst, a firm of lifestyle financial planners and independent financial advisors located in Silverstone, Northamptonshire. This is a series of unscripted and unpolished conversations with leading business owners, thought leaders and high-tech talent where we discuss their experiences within the Silverstone business and motorsport region. We will also be asking them to share their knowledge, insight and their thoughts on the future just for you. If you're looking to learn more about the Silverstone high growth region and commercially connect with like-minded peers, you've definitely come to the right place. Welcome to Inside Silverstone. Welcome to the next edition of Inside Silverstone. My name is Chris Broom and I am your host today. I am delighted to welcome to the show Chris Horton, who is Managing Director of Performance Projects. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. Absolute pleasure, Chris. Um, As is customary, as I always explain at the beginning of these shows, it would be lovely if I uh, uh, had permission to sort of run through a quick education and career snapshot of yourself, Chris, just so that our wonderful dear listeners can understand why we've asked you to come on. So is it okay if I quickly run through that? And again, as I say, I always uh, say this, uh, I got all this information off good old fashioned LinkedIn and Google. So if anything it needs correcting, do let me know. Um, uh, And actually saying that, I did notice a a spelling spelling error actually. So uh, you've put the word entrepreneurial uh, prize, which we're going to come on to in a minute right. and, and there's a slight grammatical spelling mistake in that oh, so, yeah. so that's all right so, so, so make sure you sort of touch that up on linkedin anyway i say that with a smile on my face uh, keen eye me um education um mechanical engineering uh, degree qualification from imperial college of london that's correct yeah um, and then you then did an mba uh, at the crownfield school of management Indeed. where uh, i've read that uh, you won some sort of entrepreneurial prize so what what was the prize and what was it for yeah that was a a, a prize we i took the entrepreneurial course and uh there was a challenge in there for a very small group uh projects to come in and we did um a project on an activity this one happened to be mobile a mobile based uh, application for ordering uh food and drink at sports venues or or um or or other sort of activities like that, where you could sit in your seat and order order drinks and beverages and food. So it was quite a good challenge and really got us into the flow of uh, me with a couple of people into the flow of of what does it take to be truly entrepreneurial? What what makes an attractive project and uh, and how do you sell it? Okay, um, and and then from a sort of career perspective um graduate engineer uh, for sort of beginning of your career so a number of years where you worked at an organization called ray malik um, and then after that you then transitioned into cosworth racing uh, where i think it was sort of seven eight year plus career there you sort of transitioned up the line to become a senior engineer um, you then moved across to their formula Atlantic team and then moved into their sort of F1 team as head of track support. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that's true. So the the Formula One uh, group at that point, just for their re-entry in 2010, was um, run effectively under the head of the department by two people, myself and uh, and someone else who uh, who took I took on all the track side operations as you as you rightly say all of the engine calibration but also all of the track side dealings with the teams so um whether it be uh, on an engineering or a procedural or anything else so uh, quite a wide scoping role and and so was that always the the plan the aim you clearly um qualified and and sort of cut your teeth in in mechanical engineering and did you always have one hope that that you could sort of grace the f1 scene uh, sort of, yeah. I, I, I've always been interested in racing. My my vision when I was at school, I was I was lucky enough to know what I wanted to do from from early on. Mm. At the time, I wanted to design uh, Le Mans cars. That was what really fired oh, wow. me up at school. And in my career, I've I've been on the periphery of that and and uh, and been involved with uh, Cosworth did a, a Le Mans program which I was in charge of. Um, and uh, th- that was that was interesting and uh, got a bit of interest. But really. Uh, 
the opportunities came along, particularly within Cosworth, to obviously do the full gamut of American racing with IndyCar and Champ Car, but then also uh, an early and a, and a later stint in, in F1 at different levels. And um, that that obviously was a fascinating thing and something that once I was involved in the in the Cosworth environment at that time, then then obviously Formula One and being uh, senior within Formula One, one of the one of the sort of um, uh, most prolific sort of management was was a real opportunity and, and that was a, a great experience really interesting and so what was your um sort of remit so what what were you doing um as, as head of sort of track support what did it what did it entail so that that at the time that i was commissioned to do that and and promoted to do that there was uh, there was no uh a parallel role within the factory to, to sort of work on for all the factory operations so effectively I took on all the day-to-day activity within within Formula 1 liaising with the teams understanding what they wanted and at that time obviously this was this new breed of teams that were coming in uh, the Lotuses and uh, and Virgin F1 and, and the like so these were all startup teams so so discussing with them what they wanted how to how to install how to run how to calibrate and then staffing the whole project from scratch bearing in mind Cosworth hadn't been in in Formula 1 for a few years at that stage Age. Um, so recruitment and uh, and getting the operation up and running. That's that was the scope. <laughs> so f- fairly wide and clearly very very busy. Yeah, very busy. Yeah, yeah. It was um it was it was an interesting time. Um, and then in 2010, um, you set up your own business performance projects. Yes crazy man you went to set your own business up what was that about yeah uh, crazy naive all the things that the business owners op- often say and and we would concur with um so yes in in 2010 uh, one of the challenges we had in in within cosworth that i felt was that the direction of the company they wanted a more commercial outlook to to their approach i wanted a more sporting outlook in the sense of wanting to develop technology and being in it for the long term and at that time there was a more commercial focus on 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 securing profit and all the rest of it from the program and, and using it in the wider Cosworth empire. So that really um, gave me an opportunity to think a bit widely about what I wanted to do. And at the same time, my colleague uh, who set up performance projects with me, Terence Goad, he'd been at, at Renault F1 and then Toyota F1, and they were just withdrawing from Formula One in, in, in from their base in Cologne. Mm. And so he became available and interested. Uh, he leads the technical side. I was thinking about what I wanted to do and um, I had this opportunity to, to leave. And um, I wanted to really start set something up from scratch and and really pursue some of the opportunities that we we'd spoken about. Often as engineers, we we discuss ideas that we think are good, mm. opportunities we think are good, and this was my opportunity to turn that into a, a reality. So 2010 performance projects went live, and so for those listening who um, haven't heard of you guys before or just want to know a little bit more about you, um, you know, what do you do? So we. Uh, Fundamentally, we 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 design and manufacture uh, uh, niche vehicles and motorsport uh, vehicles, either either in their entirety or, or or sections of. So we do a lot of work for for manufacturers, uh, both in motorsport but also uh, household names that want to show something new and unique, either within their own four walls to see whether something's possible from a technical point of view, or to demonstrate something internally from a technical point of view, mm. or to sort of showcase it externally to to show people. People, what might be exciting, what might be coming, or what is coming in in their parlance, um, uh, but also to uh, position themselves against their opposition and say, you know, we're already well down the line on this, and and steal the thunder. Okay, um, and so I've seen, having obviously done some research and looked at the website, um, sort of four sort of key areas, uh, which I think would be good to sort of cover off. So they've got motorsport, EV, consultancy, and niche vehicles, as you've obviously explained. So if we just keep on the, the motorsport line for now, because obviously we've gone from Cosworth F1 into obviously performance projects. So from a motorsport perspective, what 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 um, what areas do you sort of cover um and uh, from sort of f1 through to le mans british touring car and, and what things have you sort of designed and, and sort of constructed and built for, for for that sort of world um well in terms of series we cover all all major series in some form or other we've got work out there that that's running a lot of it under other people's uh names mm-hmm. so obviously i have to be very careful about what we say but sure. anything from from um uh, on the mandated series uh, design of 
um, sort of subframe suspension, steering systems, all of that kind of thing in more touring car based series, uh, um, right the way through to suspension systems and uh, some some developmental systems within within the very highest and within Formula One. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the interesting areas are people trying to develop or, or, or interested in new pieces of hardware and new technologies into into series. So we do a lot of behind the scene works, um, sort of proof of concepts and feasibility work to um, to show, particularly in this very dynamic and challenging time, uh, people where they may want to take and what what might be popular to launch and run. Okay. Um... And so that then neatly leads into sort of EV, so electric vehicles, mm. and so um, which is clearly a the sort of a hot topic at the moment. Mm. Um, you know, words being thrown around like disruptive and you know what have you, um, autonomous and, and 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 all of that. So two two really interesting things that I've seen, obviously that you guys have worked on from a project perspective. So the, so the first one, which was an absolute sort of sort of swerve ball for me when I read it, was ice cream van, electric ice cream van. So, yeah. so talk to me about that as a project. Well, that, that came about because um, uh, the sort of hook to it, if you like, with the interest, exactly as you describe, is an electric ice cream van, which is uh, um, something that, that that is just intriguing. Why, why would we do that? Well, we're talking about um, low emissions and zero emission zones in cities. Um, there is nothing more typical than a, than, a, than a sort of ice cream to sit in these busy populated sort of areas, whether it be a seafront, a park, or, or just in a, in a sort of city centre in a, in a, in a main um, square. And, and these areas are all asking for zero uh, emissions or, or, or at least ultra low emissions uh, compliance. And that particular vehicle in its own right ha- has sits chugging away as we know, mm. and uh, creates quite interesting challenges so from our point of view as a company the, the 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 sort of public side of it is the ice cream van can you make a fully electric ice cream van that's silent that's that's, that's obviously um very good for emissions very green if you like mm. um but also underlying that from a from a technical point of view is if, if you have a, a system that needs a lot of energy uh ice creams that take a lot of energy to, to make quickly as on a summer's day um that's not dissimilar to a lot of other systems and a lot of other requirements in construction and support and, and all the rest of it that require um, whole vehicle, quite high energy use. So the, 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 the interest was in the ice cream van. We successfully proved that it was uh, both uh, very feasible and possible. So uh, uh, all electric ice cream vans are, 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 are here and, 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 uh, and coming. Mm. Um, but also, if you happen to be involved in something else, um, construction or, or support, then, then adapting vehicles with qu- these quite large power sources on board uh, enable you to carry on doing doing the businesses that you need to do within that environment. So, so there's a there's an interest, a public interest, and a, and a behind the scenes sort of technical and, and commercial uh, venture that's that's been really very um, very good, very challenging, and, and has wider appeal. And then presumably the the lessons learned within that, as well as other projects that you're working on, then led into what I've also seen on the website, which is agricultural vehicles. And so we're sat in the heart of Motorsport Valley. You know, we're, we're recording this uh, this podcast uh, in the Innovation Centre on Silverstone Park next to Silverstone Circuits. But you're designing agricultural vehicles. So talk to us about that, because that sounds fascinating. It is a it is a great project. Um, we. So I, th- I think the, the the basic the basic sort of line back to what we were talking before was was that um, the the skills required and the engineering and the development process required to do a, a good motorsport program of being able to build very low volumes of very effective vehicles has a direct parallel to any other market effectively. So that's the transition, which isn't as as crazy as it first sounds. Mm. But the agricultural angle is is very fascinating. We've 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 got a company that came to us, an Oxford-based company uh, called uh, Dynium Robot, who are interested in developing autonomous systems, um, and they wanted to have a platform that was their own that enabled them to optimize the capability of of their system and um that was that was that was very unique so there was a strategic angle both commercially and and technically um so they 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 approached us saying we want to make a, a vehicle we don't want to use anyone else's we want it to be small compact and um and therefore um create a fully autonomous product which in its own right is 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 very interesting because it changes the way that that farmers work with with various 
challenges of Brexit and labour and, and the sort of uh, labour that's required on a farm to operate these things. The concept of using autonomous vehicles is obviously very attractive where you can run and service half a dozen vehicles uh, in one go and they're busy operating. But this latest version that we're that we're just completing is going live now um, builds on the on the diesel hydraulic version, which was the, the sort of first generation. The second generation is is fully electric, and that enables the the farmers to use the wind turbines and the solar arrays, uh, harvest the energy in the daytime, but use it for for the farming processes that that are more efficiently done at night. So the sort of crop spraying and that kind of thing, mm. when the thermals are lowest. Mm. So it changes their working patterns and it enables them to level demand and it enables them to use their own power rather than changing the rate at which they get for putting it back in the grid at the, at the, at the lower value times in the, in the heat of the day. So the, the impact within, within agriculture, um, this, this, these vehicles are fully autonomous because they work under the canopy, under orchards or polytunnels or whatever, mm. so they can target the very minimum and the very localised areas that they need to very mm. early in the process. And so the technology of what they're trying to achieve in terms of spraying and harvesting and all the other bits in a very condensed under canopy layer, um, combined with the, the autonomy and the way they use their energy, completely changes their, their, their viewpoint on agriculture. And so from our perspective as a as design company, a great challenge, completely clean sheet vehicle, but also no operating practice to really call upon. So we get we get very involved in it from from a process and principle right the way through to the final vehicle rolling out of our door. And so clean sheet being the principle of it's a blank page. And so you're free to do what you do and create. Completely. So we have a spec. There was a spec, for instance, for the full uh, electric one um, that we knew where it needed to operate. So in terms of its its, its overall size, uh, that, that was sort of known and its turning circle and all those kinds of things and power capacity. But in terms of how it should look, how it should operate, um, some of the some of the challenges, what size motor should it have? Because it had a very clear remit for the work it needed to do. But with the technology developing very quickly and the new markets opening up, should we limit it there or should we take a much further stretch because it's far easier to to show something that's got much greater capacity and then downsize it um, when you need to rather than trying to convince people that it could be capable of doing more work mm. um, but currently isn't. So the strategic and, and business positioning all, all fell into the pot. And so uh, these are presumably they've been designed. Are they, are they active at the moment? Are these things are farmers using these? Or are they being tested? Uh, so they're currently they're, they're, the the diesel hydraulic one is 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 rolling around and that's uh, that's in in development and, and operating. So mm-hmm. it's got a very small um, uh, pool of users at the moment. Mm-hmm. And uh, as the technology is developing, that's that's expanding. Mm-hmm. And the all electric version is is just going live now. So that's in build uh, in the unit right now and due to uh, roll out under its own power within the next few weeks okay yeah it's it, 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 a really good challenge for any sort of budding engineers out there it's it's a really good example of getting your teeth into something completely new mm. and it's a good project it's like a you know, morally health for this it's you know it's it's good you know you, you are creating something that's going to help ultimately bring value to UK farmers, yep. um, uh, you know, enable, uh, you know, society to, to benefit from locally produced product as opposed to, to importing yep. um, clean energy. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of ticks, right? It's, it's, it is very good. And, and, and it's rare that you get involved in such a project where you, you can imagine looking out and seeing a, a very different landscape with the type of machinery that we're rolling around it in. 10, 15 years time yeah. due to what we're doing now. And that's unique. I, I would say that's unique. It's that's special. I love it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Something to look back and be incredibly proud of, of, of that. And so sort of, I can see from the smile, that'll be, you know, <laughs> I think that's a pretty special thing to do. Certainly in South Northamptonshire where we're both living, it's uh, to be able to then see potentially something that you've been, you've been producing in the beautiful fields that we're surrounded by. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's good. I, I, we've, we've, we've been very, um, like I say, it's a collaborative project. We're designing it for, for the client who's got their autonomous systems and it's, it's really nice to be involved in that and it's a great relationship they value what we do in being able to to get something off the ground so quick such a quick turnaround and that and that works it's a fully functioning item and they're left um to focus on what they're very good at and, and what their key sort of intellectual property is and their strategy and and between the the two that's a fascinating uh, combination it's something that that that's a, a great example of a, a very positive way to move things forward okay 
moving on to niche vehicles and so for all of our sort of sports fans and you know motor motor fans some things that i've seen on the website so your involvement with the sort of goodwood folk aston martin morgan bugatti talk to us about niche vehicles and and what you've done or what you're allowed to talk about and you know but what you what you guys enjoy yeah doing there's there. there's a lot we can uh, we can talk about um certainly we we do an awful lot in um in, in niche vehicles whether it's historic pre-war right the way through to pretty contemporary vehicles whether it's um sort of reverse engineering, um, supporting these vehicles to run uh, recreation or restoration type work. Mm. So we tend to partner for that kind of thing with with specialists who know their marks. So like you say, you, you picked out Bugatti and Aston as two, as two things. So either OEMs or, or specialists. So they know their customers, they know what they're interested in, in, in developing. But obviously the transition over years has been from 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 sort of being able to make stuff manually on, on traditional machinery to now requiring CNC machinery and more modern practice to, to, to because that's the production process that's widely available what, but also what's CNC machinery? So uh, computer numerically controlled so all the computer controlled machining and and, and, and turning mm-hmm. um, but that's that's what's prolific now that's that's the system that's what creates good quality so you 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 have to start with a computer model for the bit you're making um but once you've proved it once it's highly repeatable it's very accurate and so you can you can run them off so that's the the both the cost effective way but also the reliable for quality sort of methodology that you'd use but for a lot of these these marks and these resources that that, that these things don't exist in computer format so we will model those and reverse engineer near you know existing non-existing drawn bits for any of those um whatever's required and sometimes it's people get quite worried in the historic market especially about performance upgrades and in fairness 99.9 percent of everything we do is is not about reliability changes and changing the dynamic of old vehicles it's it's normally um purely reliability so you, so people may request that you might put in a modern oil seal to stop it leaking or something like that but it doesn't in any way change the characteristic of the car change the performance it just means that you can sit it leaving in your garage for a number of months and expect mm. it to come come good and come alive and not seize and not leak and all the other things so it's a win-win for everyone and the cars perform well and and that's what people that's what the market wants people are really interested in being able to keep their cars running and and, yeah. and, and and drive them it's a reliability thing isn't it you know you know and an efficiency perspective so all you're doing presumably is tweaking and improving slight elements where 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 where, where required yeah and, and like i say not for performance purely purely so that it, as the cars become more valuable if we're talking purely this is only one area of what we do but the for the historic sense people are being um, most cars now, as they become more valuable, if you if for Bugattis or, or Alphas or Astons, that kind of thing, particularly pre-war, the owners are less and less um, likely to um, uh, to um, restore or develop or, or, or build and maintain them themselves. So mm. they use a specialist, but the specialist has the challenge that um, if it leaks, as it would have done back in the day with traditional string seals and you know, graphite impregnated seals and that kind of thing, then then somebody who's who's paying them a lot of money to do that receives the car back, it sits there and it leaks. Mm. And that's a concern both from the client who's, who's commissioned the car to be, had some work done on it. There's also a reliability because it's a potential seizure. So nobody's happy in that relationship because because the client's concerned that it's not built as as it should be when in fact it it is built as it should be Um, but also when they leave it there and then get it out of wherever it's it is whether it's their garage or storage or whatever it might be to run it in the in the nice events and the nice days there's a there's a reliability concern so from everyone's perspective to to use some of these things but to keep the character keep the performance and the noise and the smells and all the other Mm, things we like the mm, same mm. is is is, is a complete win-win and everyone enjoys the vehicles and it hasn't detracted in any way um, um, in, in it and, it and it enhances the enjoyment without changing, it's, it's enhanced enjoyment without changing, uh, without making them go any quicker. And presumably with with some of the sort of specialist sort of niche product 
projects that you're working on, you, you're getting uh, individuals or companies coming to you saying, we want to see, you know, what if this could be done to a vehicle yeah. or to a project, um, to, to whether it be to further their own nest, as you've said, in front of competitors, perhaps yes. you know, publicly, yep. or actually just out of pure interest over over a certain sort of area. Is that right? Yeah, and the most the most extreme example of that that we've been involved in that I, I can't talk about the manufacturer or the or the or the model, but they had a vehicle range that was seen as being quite dowdy. It was recently released, quite a quirky looking vehicle, um, and they wanted to position it up against a competitor's car that had a sporty version out there, and so they asked to produce uh, take their their top end sports car, which had absolutely no relationship to the model that, that they wanted to, to, to talk about, mm. but they wanted to take the entire powertrain, the entire the entire vehicle out of one, um, and put it into the under underpin it, if you like, put it under the um, under the the sort of um, top hat it effectively take the top of the car so it looked like the model they were trying to promote mm-hmm. but have all the performance of their very highest end sports car mm-hmm. and then market that and that 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 showed the sort of that was very much the signaling it was very much the what if we produce this mm-hmm. it, it's it's there was lots on it there's a big media campaign uh, about it and it ultimately sprouted a, a whole range of performance options having given them both the confidence to do that but also the interest from the public to say I could see myself driving one of those. If it's mm. anything like that, rather than it being this really strange, quirky mm. model, mm. suddenly I, I get it. Now it's quite cool that it's quirky and mm. it's quite performance-led. Mm. And it was it was a highly extreme build, um, only a few built, um, but the uh, the impact that that had and the value that that had was was immense for the manufacturer, and it's and it then instantly set them um, on that level pegging uh, sort of sort of thing with a with a brand and a model that had had you know 50 years of heritage. There we are. We're recording this podcast, as I said before, in the Innovation Centre, Silverstone Park. Um, your firm, uh, Performance Projects, as well as mine, Longhurst, were member firms of the Silverstone Technology Cluster. Indeed, yes. Why did you join the Silverstone Technology Cluster? Um, well, we, we thought we looked at it in the in the in the early days and uh, thought that it was it was a really interesting opportunity to to engage with people. Quite a lot of what we do is is genuinely collaborative. We, we like with the agricultural vehicle, we work very well when, when you can identify companies that are doing very interesting work um, that provide something you don't, but equally are strengthened by what you do do, mm. um, then, then it's a very happy place to be. And, and if you can identify enough of those projects, um, then, then, then you get involved in some, some incredibly interesting stuff that then obviously proliferates on. And from a, a cluster point of view, um, to give back, uh, you can obviously talk about those. Hopefully, you can inspire. We're certainly happy to talk about what we do, what we can talk about. We're very happy to. And um, to sort of talk to people about how we would structure projects, even if they're what you might term competitors, um, we, we rarely find that the opportunity necessarily would have come our way because they're people they know and we don't. And and actually, you strengthen the environment, you strengthen the crossover, and, and most of what you talk about that you can talk about, um, it all comes good in the process of time. You know, you, you're seen as a trusted person. You do you do occasionally get mutual work or references and things and bits and pieces, and you're, you're stronger as a herd, as a group. And it, it's been a fascinating environment to be in and to see it grow as it is 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 very exciting really good and presumably same sort of positive feedback on the special interest group so you know i i you know uh, you spoke at the end of last year at the sort of metrology special interest group yeah um, good feedback from that presumably good engagement yes yeah and you're never sure what people are going to pick up on and and, mm. and there's usually something in it for you know, obviously people have, have elected to go there they're interested in the subject matter but they may be interested in a different area to to sort of what you imagine might be for, for some people they have, they have special interests of their own and, and key areas of interest and uh, yeah it's, it's good you, you 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 pick up some very interesting things some things as a, as a as an attendee that you think oh, that's quite fascinating that's got a parallel with what i'm doing and and so they are very worthwhile and you're based on silverstone park as a business yeah so we are one of a, a handful of companies that have gone through the the entire process of Silverstone Park, mm-hmm. from um, uh, hot desking in our uh, in 2010 
to uh, an office. We had a design office in the innovation center for a number of years. And then for the last few years, we've been in our, our own unit as a, as, a, as a standalone entity on the estate. And, and thoughts on the sort of community and, and Silverstone Park, presumably, you know, MEPC coming in and doing what they've done is, is a, has been a positive thing. It's created more of a community. Yeah, it's it's been interesting seeing the transition over for for MEPC. Um, it's been it's been good. Obviously, the they're working very heavily on the value. So obviously, the the cost structure and bits and pieces changes, but what you get out of it changes as well. Mm. And um, it's been good. Yeah, there's certainly great vision and. Um, uh, and and some of these opportunities that have come up have undoubtedly been through some of the work that they've done. And what about your connection to Silverstone? So I know from a from a l- little bird has told me that once upon a time you were involved in racing yourself, Formula Ford. Yeah, that's right. And so what's the is there sort of a, a legacy there from connected to your family in Silverstone? What's the what's the story and genesis of that? Yeah, well, I've always been involved in 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 motorsport from before when I was uh, professionally involved from a, a, just a, a family interest. I've I've been uh, in it since the day I was born, going to racetracks. But really, it goes back a couple of generations. So my my father uh, has raced all his life at an amateur level, uh, enjoying it for 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 his own sort of pleasure and and social fun, if you like. What sort of racing? Uh, so my father is involved in uh, pre-war racing. So he's interested in a uh, uh, big member of the Biatti Owners Club and the VSCC. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, won a few things here. The, they, the VSCC do a very interesting all-comers race where they, they have a, a formula that equates modern vehicles with old ones called the Pomeroy every February. And so he's... Uh, He's been very successful in that one of the, one of the biggest winners of that multiple winners of that pro trophy. So that, that's wow. that's his sort of interest in in Silverstone. Mm. Um, but lots of things uh, in terms of different events over over the many years. Silverstone Classic where we drove together. Uh, really, here. really. Uh, what was that like? Uh, that was that was very interesting. I live relatively locally, so my first experience of driving the car was driving from from home to here all of about 10 miles and uh to uh, uh sort of the opening event and then the next thing i know he was trying to trying to offer me the opportunity and i say that with a, a slight wry smile of doing a traditional le mans start mm-hmm. running across the track <laughs> jump into it, uh, which you know is great fun but it's quite daunting when literally your stable your stable environment is having fired it up once and driven it less than 10 miles um but we did yeah that was really good we did uh, it was an hour's race and we did a, a father-son handover which was great fun. Mm. Uh, obviously, a little bit competitive between ourselves, sure. and uh, yeah, jumping in the car to make it the most, uh, the quickest, and also the most flamboyant and youthful that you can generate is, mm. is obviously quite quite who, good fun. Who was quicker? <laughs> well, uh, I think at that time he was quicker in that car. Um, but since then, we've we've raced in the same race in different cars, and he's played a he's played the wise uh, old owl card of of making sure he gives me the faster car, so uh, he, you know he can be closer and play the yeah. But if I'd have been driving it, I'd have been quicker still. Standard card. Standard. So um, so that's him. But before that, again, uh, his father, my my grandfather, was racing here in the early sixties. We have uh, a relationship right the way back through uh, to um, Connaughts and uh, and other vehicles, but specifically Connaughts, some Jaguars, uh, XK one twenties and forties. But um, the Connaught was the was the uh, most competitive car. Um, so that was raced just after they'd been sold by the factory the Connaught factory closed and they went into private hands uh, a certain Bernie Eccleston bought some of the cars mm. uh, my grandfather bought one uh, and then a second one and so they ran uh, a pair of cars and uh, he himself raced here and that was the that was the handover from from him to my father and my father to me wow good story <laughs> um before we get on to sort of last questions um is there anything that we haven't covered off? Anything I haven't asked you that that you wanted to? Whilst we've got you on air, I know you've been very very busy. Anything else you wanted to, to talk about? Uh, no, I think I think that um, generally what what we're known for is obviously in these challenging programs, uh, getting involved in, in in being able to provide both engineering support, but also sort of whole solutions, whether it be areas of cars, bits, or, or whole vehicles. So we're always interested. We like we certainly like helping people out with 
we'd sort of signposted through uh, through the various network or through our, you know if there's anything we can help with directly. But we're we're always happy to to help and uh, and assist in some of the interesting projects that that crop up that we know other people that can help with. We're we're, we're always keen to discuss and and. Um, Usually, if there's a project for us, fine. And, and if there isn't, we we just like to see some some interesting stuff come off here. Cool. Last two questions. Mm-hmm. So, if you've listened to a couple of podcasts before, you should know these. And I forgot to remind you about this before we started recording. So we'll see if we can catch you on the hop. So, two last questions. One is about embarrassing mistakes. Whether or not there's anything in Chris Chris's locker that's ever, <laughs> ever, ever happened in the past, professionally, <laughs> ideally, that you'd be prepared to share with the community. And we've had some absolute belters from the likes of Roz through to everybody, uh, and obviously Simon Dowson, you know, whose episode guys guys live today. Um, you know, obviously has the, the sort of piece de resistance with. with Yep. With, with what he did um, and then the very last question so I'm going to give you a moment to think about that and then the very last question is about uh, you know what bit of advice would you give your younger self now that you've been on the journey that you've been on so let's pause for a moment so the first question is going to be embarrassing mistakes so is there anything in your locker that you'd be, <laughs> you'd be prepared to share with our wonderful listeners uh I can offer a couple quick ones, actually. Uh, one, a professional one, was um, uh, not relevant to what we do now, but when I was in uh, in my in, in the track support days, there was one comical moment, uh, which was a real wake up call, which was in a very wet uh, Formula One race at Brazil, where um, half the cars were starting from the pit lane and were having problems due to water and all the rest of it. The other half were out on the grid. Our car was on the grid, uh, the Jag at that time, and. Um, I was running down the pit lane with computer and, and in the Mac and all the rest of it uh, through the teeming rain. I looked up, up on screen and I saw this fat chap on screen and it was quite awkward. And I thought, oh, I feel a bit sorry for him, you know, carrying around that and running through. And then that slow, sickening realisation of oh, God, that wasn't anybody that that was that was me oh and having to realize that you go actually it is true the camera does add a few pounds but even so it was time to slim down a bit that was that was quite funny i think you could even see on the screen the the very slow penny dropping as, as i was <laughs> running to the do, back do you know what sometimes that's needed right and so you know you're looking very fit and healthy you know and I, I had a similar thing several years ago i did a pr- promotional video for an ex-employer and uh, i saw myself and I thought jesus i need to shred a, a stone or two so you know these things are meant to happen right so so at least you can laugh about it now i can very much laugh about it and, and friends and family obviously made sure i knew about it as well so that was good <laughs> good, good old friends and family um uh, but yeah and and in a private in, in the more sort of private to going back to the uh the father-son racing thing at an event we um it was my first ever race meeting and uh, my first ever practice session i'd done testing before that and that was something i was racing with uh with with uh, with a car and i went out and my father was also racing in the same session practicing the same session and i literally came out the holding area got to the first corner and went straight off (laughs) <laughs> uh, and, uh, and nothing will prepare you for the sight of uh, of a family member also driving driving past with his neck craned round, <laughs> with, with even through a full face visor, sort of the look of disbelief and imbecile, which again. <laughs> It was quite an experience and uh, a rare one for me, but one I learned a lot from. Oh, great. Two great stories, Chris. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, last question. Um, we ask about uh, you know, a nugget piece of sort of wisdom that you'd provide a younger self. And one of the reasons we ask that is that we know we've got some students listening to the show, which is fantastic. So, you know, you clearly a master in your field, no doubt about that, um, and have um, worked your way up the proverbial ladder um, and earn your stripes, no doubt. But there would have come a time when you were a younger self, a little bit, a little bit wet behind the ears, a little bit green. So if you're going to take yourself back to then, what one bit of excellent advice would you give yourself? Well, certainly the thing we've seen and I've seen personally is that there are so many ways to get in, into the industry if, if you're interested in motorsports, so many different positions and types of work. But the thing that, particularly at the at the top level, that that we saw that that's that's really interesting is 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 be the best you can be at whatever you choose to do and really enjoy it. Choose something you like to do and then try to excel at it, whether it's um, obviously more on the hands-on front, whether it's event support, whether it's, it's anything. Uh, for me, obviously, it was at an engineering and design level uh, and, and the sport of competition, doing as well as I could in that. But it was really picking something and uh, being sort of trying to excel at it at whatever level you want to. But 
but it's the trustworthy nature it's the dedicating yourself it's it's being a reliable part of the team and and if you're all those things then uh people are always interested in you and, and you'll go far i have absolutely nothing else to add to that chris so um we are 38 minutes in hasn't that whizzed through so we've literally covered off education career f1 performance projects what you guys niching motorsport ev niche vehicles proof of concept what if projects collaborative partnerships stc silverstone park and your family legacy and memories of silverstone so chris unless there's anything else i'd like to thank you very very much for coming on the show um thank you for your time and hopefully in due time in in the future seasons that we run of the podcast we can get you back on certainly to talk about things like the agricultural project which we're we're very interested in um, but also just more so around this sort of ev electric vehicle autonomous sort of conversation so chris as i said thank you very much for coming on the show thank you very much thanks for having me The Inside Silverstone podcast is produced by the team at Longhurst for the benefit of those with a passion for all things tech, engineering and innovation. For more information, please visit longhurst.co.uk forward slash Inside Silverstone, whilst also remembering to give us a 5 out of 5 star rating on iTunes. Please note that neither Chris Broom or Longhurst work for Silverstone Park, Silverstone Circuit or Silverstone Technology Cluster.